Amen. Well, since you already have your Bibles in your hand, thank you, Pastor Brian, for that. Saved us a step. Open them to the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to be in chapter 17. So we're taking a short one-week break on our study of Ephesians while Pastor Jeremy is on a well-deserved vacation. So you're stuck with me this morning, but I'm so thankful for him and giving me the opportunity to be before you today and open God's Word. I pray that it blesses you as much as it is blessed and challenged me as I studied it this week. So Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19, and by the way, happy Thanksgiving week. For those of you that are in the school system of the Olathe schools, you have an extra something to be thankful for. No school all week. Now, it's getting a little ridiculous. I don't think that ever happened for us if you're born in the 80s or 70s or even 90s, right? So you have something extra special to be thankful for this week, but that's really what God used to lead me to this passage was this notion of thanksgiving's coming. We have so much to be thankful for. Lead us to a passage that truly talks about thankfulness, and that's what we find here. It's something that's very familiar to you. If you've grown up in the church, this is the story of Jesus healing the 10 lepers, And as you know from that story, there's only one of them that returned to give true thanks. So that's what we're going to unpack this morning. But it's very dangerous to jump right into the middle of a book in the Bible without much context. That's why we love studying verse by verse through books of the Bible, because you have all that context before the passage that you're actually studying. So Real quick, a little bit of context here, because it's easy to read just this passage and say, oh, well, that story's about thankfulness. It's about this one guy who is truly thankful that returned to tell Jesus, thank you for healing me. But if we do that, we miss the entire purpose of the passage. So we have to have some context from the larger gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 4, it kind of helps us with that. It's where Jesus begins his ministry, and if you remember, he was in the temple, and he opened the book of Isaiah and read some of the prophecy from the book of Isaiah, and then he sat down and he said, by the way, that's me. All those things that Isaiah prophesied about that was coming, I'm here. So we know that Jesus came for a very specific reason. And then if we flip over two chapters to chapter 19, we really read what is at the heart of the gospel of Luke, and it's what he says in that account of Zacchaeus in Luke 19, verse 10. He says, For the Son of God has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And that is the big idea of the book of Luke, that Jesus came as a baby, lived a sinless life, went to the cross, died a sin that we deserve to die, didn't stay dead, rose again on the third day, and he is now sitting at the right hand of God the Father praying for us today. That is the story of the gospel, that Jesus paid the price for our sins so that we can have a relationship with God. So Jesus came to seek and save the lost. So as we read this this morning, let's keep that in mind as we go through this account. And if I could boil this whole thing down to one sentence or one kind, of, one kind of structure, it would be this, that just like these lepers that we're going to talk about here in just a minute, just like them, Jesus sees us, Jesus hears us, and Jesus came so that we might have true salvation that is only found in him. So let's keep that in mind, and we're going to read this passage together Luke 17, verses 11 through 19, says this. While he was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, ten leprous men stood at a distance to meet him. And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Verse 15, now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, were were there not ten cleansed? 
But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we open your word and we seek to hear from you, God, allow our hearts to be open. That, God, that we would see ourselves in this story. That we would see how you are trying to change our hearts and change the way just like you did these lepers. So, God, as we work our way through this passage, I pray that your Holy Spirit reigns free in our hearts so that you can speak to us in a mighty way. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, there's four things that I found through this text. So if you're a note taker, there's going to be four points. The first thing we're going to talk about here is the leper's cry in verse 11 through 13. So verse 11, it starts off by saying, while he was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And we know from other gospels, from other parts in the gospels, that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem for a specific reason. And that's to go to the cross. So we know that he had been ministering to all the folks in that region, in different towns and different villages, but now he finds himself on his final descent into Jerusalem to do the very thing that Luke's gospel tells us later, and that's to die for our, for our sins on the cross. So we know that Jesus is heading there. And we also know from other gospel accounts that a lot of the miracles that he had performed had already happened. So Lazarus has been raised. Other lepers have been healed. So many things has happened. So his, Jesus, the word about Jesus has been spreading throughout the region. Everybody knows who he is and the power that he has to heal people. But it's significant that he says that Luke writes that he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. Because if you're a Jewish person, you don't go anywhere near Samaria. Right In John chapter 4, we learn that about the woman at the well. She was a Samaritan woman, and she said, why are you a Jew even talking to me, a Samaritan woman? So we know it's significant that Jesus did not abide by the culture's way of thinking. There was no one that was outside of his reach, and he wanted to go to each person. So that's why he doesn't go around Samaria like most Jews would here. And then verse 12 says, as he entered a village, 10 leprous men stood at a distance to meet him. Now the village is unnamed. We can take that to mean that it had no uh, real meaning to this passage here, which is fine. But then we see that these 10 leprous men were standing there waiting to meet him. And I I know that you've heard of leprosy. Most of us kind of know what it is. Uh, But it is a nasty, nasty, really skin disease that causes your flesh to literally rot away. I had a picture of a guy's hands that had leprosy, and they were curled up into a little ball, and the last two digits of all his fingers had rotten and fallen off. And I asked Jess, I was like, can I show this to them so that they kind of understand? And she was like, do not do that. So you can thank her for not seeing this picture, but... It does a lot to kind of show what this disease does. And for 3,500 years, there was no cure. In fact, it wasn't until the 1980s that we came up with a cure for this disease called leprosy. And it can affect every part of a person's body. Literally, limbs could fall off. If it gets in your eyes, you're blind, your voice, uh, you can't talk. It is a nasty disease, and that's why you can, you can read this for yourselves in Leviticus 13 and 14, all about it. But it was taken very seriously because they didn't want it to spread. So if somebody came up with leprosy on their skin, the priest would quarantine them to the outskirts of society. They were no longer able to live within the city. They had to leave the city, live outside the gates by themselves, and not have any, you, you were immediately bankrupt if you contracted, contracted leprosy. You, you had no, your family was gone, your job was gone. The priest would go into your house, burn the things that you had used in the past so that, to try and keep this from spreading to other people. So it was as devastating as a thing that you could imagine if that happens to you. So that's what these 10 guys are dealing with. They are literally at the end of their rope, 
And they've congregated together in what I think is a way, hey, let's get together and use all of our voices. And when Jesus comes, we know he's healed people in the past. Maybe we can get him to heal us. This is literally their only hope. They are desperate. Otherwise, they would just rot away literally and die. So here are these 10 men, having heard Jesus is coming, standing at the edge of the, of the village there. And by the way, this is a good thing that, that really hit me this week as I was studying this. These guys congregated together because they had something in common. They were all they had. But it also is a good word of warning for us to ask this simple question. Who do we congregate with and what does that say about us? Are we congregating with people that are encouraging, that are uplifting, that are helping us stay on the narrow path? Or are we congregating with people that tell lies, that gossip, that speak bad things to you, that encourage you in the wrong ways? So these guys had to congregate with people that were like them. So make sure we're congregating with people that are edifying to us and not trying to drag us down. And then verse 13, it says this, And they raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So that word master is them saying, we recognize you, Jesus, as the only one with authority to do what we need you to do. No one else we've ever heard of can do this. So master, please have mercy on us. We are literally rotting away. Will you please have mercy on us? And it probably took everything they had to raise up enough muster to shout that out as Jesus was coming by. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7 says, For God does not see what man sees, since man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, all the Jews and the Samaritans in that region, they looked at what was going on on the outside. But here we're going to see in just a minute, Jesus sees what's on the heart. So as disgusting as we may look or smell or whatever, Praise God that Jesus does not see that. He sees what's on the inside of us. And really, sin is a great illustration for on the inside of what leprosy is on the outside. We can visibly see all these skin mar, all these diseases on the outside. Sin we can't see. It literally eats us away from the inside when we get caught up and continue to do things that we know is against God's plan for our lives. So it's a great illustration for this. So is there things in our lives that is the leprosy that we need to deal with and that we need to take before God? He's the only one that these leopards, and they knew it, he was the only one that could heal them. So moving on, we see the lepers cry for help. And then number two, we see the Lord's command. Verse 14 says, when he saw them, and, and pausing there, I think Luke writes this for a specific reason. It's, it's not insignificant that he said Jesus saw them because it's a good word for us today that Jesus sees us right where we're at. No matter what's going on in our life, he sees us. And we know that because he created us. He created you. And since he created you, he sees us. Jesus, God, is everywhere, always, simultaneously. That's hard to wrap our minds around. He is all, everywhere, always, simultaneously. And if any of you can put that into something that makes sense, let me know because I'll have you come downstairs and explain it to the kids next week. But that is a concept that's hard for us to grasp our minds around, that he always sees where we're at, always, And then he said to them, verse 14, go and show yourselves to the priest. Now, this is a little bit of an odd response from Jesus here. He just simply says, go and show yourselves to the priest. Like, if you were the lepers, wouldn't you be expecting, like, you're healed or whatever he's said in the past about healing some? But no, he doesn't say you're healed. He doesn't say any of that. He just says, go Show yourselves to the priest. Well, what does that mean? 
And I think Jesus did this for two reasons. I think the first thing he did, he wanted to see if they really believed that he was the master. I, I think he, he wanted to see, do they really believe that Jesus had this power to do this? And then secondly, he did it so that he would stay in, in um, confi- that he would follow the law so that he would not be going outside of the law that they were accustomed to. Because again, in Leviticus chapter 13 and 14, you can read all about it. When somebody contracts leprosy, they have to go before the priest, and the priest will determine. The priests were the health inspectors of the day. Nobody did anything without the priest signing off. So they had to go before the priest, and there was an eight-day process, and they had to inspect the body, and sometimes they had to come back for another eight days and do it all over again, and it was just this long process. So I think Jesus wanted to see, do they really believe that he was the Christ? And then second, to not buck the system, so to speak. And, uh, and every time I read this, it, well, let's continue on in verse 14 because it, it says it, as they were going, they were cleansed. So Jesus simply says, go and show yourself to the priest. And the next line is, and as they were going, they were cleansed. Could there be more of an anticlimactic healing? Like, this is amazing, and as they were going, they were healed. If, if we were writing the story, we would probably say something like, and as they were going, they were cleansed, and three rainbows have appeared in the sky, and the skies opened up, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and God said, you're healed. But that didn't happen. Nothing extravagant happened. They simply wa- were walking away, and they were healed. Imagine being the leper, seeing your flesh and your hands come back to shape, take form. Maybe you could talk for the first time in umpteen years. Maybe you could even walk for the first time. And so this was a major miracle. And in in Luke just simply, it just shows you that when you've been walking with the Lord for a while, nothing surprises you. Luke simply says, and as they were going, they were cleansed. But it is a great reminder for us that remember back in Luke 5 when Jesus healed the the leprous man Jesus reached out his hand and he touched him and he said your faith has saved you he reached out his hand and touched him here there was no touching Jesus spoke and the miracle happened and I couldn't help but think of how legalistic we can become as a society and as a group of Christians in our world today that we somehow think that God and Jesus can only act in a certain way that we approve of. Like, you do not have to walk an aisle in a Southern Baptist church to be saved. I'll probably get a letter about that at some point, but you do not have to walk an aisle in a Baptist church to be saved, meaning God can save who he wants, when he wants, and why he wants, and we have absolutely nothing to do with it. So let's get over ourselves and think that it can only be done a certain way. Maybe you gave your heart to Christ in VBS 20 years ago. Maybe you gave your heart to Christ when you were driving down the road, when you were at the end of your rope and you cried out to God for help. Those things can happen because God is sovereign over all things. So he can save and he can heal as he wants because he is God and we are not. So praise the Lord that he heals as he wants. So we see the lepers cry for help and we see Jesus command to go and as they went, they're healed. And then thirdly, we see the lepers' reaction to this. Verse 15. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. Now this is what we're talking about as true thanksgiving as we approach this holiday season. This is what true thanksgiving and being grateful looks like. One of the lepers returned to truly give thanks. But it wasn't just giving thanks. We just sung about it this morning. It's falling at the feet of the one in whom salvation is found. And that's Christ and Christ alone. This guy, this one leper was worshiping Jesus as God. He understood what the author of Hebrews says, that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. 
We have nothing to do with salvation. It is through Christ alone. Luke in Acts, later on, he writes, there's salvation that is found, it, salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And this one understood it. This leper understood it. And one day we know that every knee will bow and every tongue will f- confess him. But my prayer is that we do that willfully while we have an opportunity to respond with what God is calling us to do. And then at the uh, end of verse 16, there's this kind of random sentence, but we know that it's there for a reason. And it says, and he was a Samaritan. Luke is pointing out the fact that if anyone was the most likely not to come back, it was this guy. Why didn't the nine Jews come back? They all went off to the priest and they started the the, the reinstatement process, but this one, he knew there was more going on here than just physical healing. But he was a Samaritan. He had a double whammy. He was not only a Samaritan, but he was a leprous Samaritan. That means he was the lowest of the lowest of the low. But this is the one that came back, and that's what Luke is pointing out. The Samaritan came back. And it's just a great reminder for us, friends. Nobody is too far gone for the saving power of Jesus Christ. Nobody. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've thought. None of the things that you have done will keep you from becoming a child of God when we do what this one says and fall at our feet and worship him and surrender our life to him. Nobody is too far gone. If this Samaritan leopard can be saved, so can you. Jesus showed us again that he came for the marginalized in society. He didn't come for the guys and ladies that have it all figured out. He came for those that are hurting, that are at their wits end, that have no other place to turn than to him. And Romans 5, 8 says it like this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Praise the Lord that he is not leaving us to ourselves in our own sin, that while we were sinners, he died for us. And that's something to be thankful for this week. And here's, a, here's three verses that stood out as something that we should mark down. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. This, this, is like, this is a Thanksgiving Day set of verses right here. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. And why? Because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God's will is not for you to be a bunch of miserable people that are standing outside the city pouting that, Other people have it better than you. God's will is that you pray without ceasing, that you rejoice always, and in everything give thanks. And we have an opportunity to do that this Thanksgiving season and show your friends and your family and the world why we're different. This is God's will for you. So the lepers cried out to Christ. He commanded them to go. The one returned And fourthly, we see the lasting result in verses 17 through 19. Verse 17 says, Jesus answered him and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? And in the Greek, the the emphasis is actually on the word where at the end of the sentence. So it's actually, Jesus is actually saying, Weren't there ten? They are where? Where? Where did they go? Jesus is emphasizing. And I think he did this. um, Well, I think the reason why these nine did not return to give thanks, there's a couple things going on here. I think they're like everyone else in our society that doesn't know him, quite frankly. They want all the things that Jesus can do for them. They want the healing. They want the blessings. They want the, the good feelings but they don't want the Savior, that, the same Savior that said, go and sell everything you have and follow me. They want all the stuff. 
but they don't want true eternal salvation because that might mean suffering in this world. That might mean giving up some of the things that they have. They didn't want Jesus to be the Messiah. They liked their life on earth. They wanted to just go back to their good and normal life and that was it. Most of the time, most people are ungrateful. Would you agree with that? In Johnson County in 2022, most of the time, most people are ungrateful. And I think that's what these folks were, great, we got healed, now we're just going to go back. They weren't truly thankful. So which one are you this morning? Jesus asked, but the nine, where are they? I pray that Jesus does not say that on the day we all leave this earth. But where is John? Where is Jane? Where is, insert your name here, or the one you've been praying for here, or your family member here that doesn't know him? I pray that Jesus does not have to ask that on that day. And we have a short time here on earth to make that decision. And then in verse 18, he asks another rhetorical question. Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except for this foreigner? So this word foreigner is a very interesting word because it obviously means somebody of a different race or somebody from the outside. But that word foreigner, it's actually written on the walls of the temple saying, Samaritans, non-Jews, you are not welcome here. You are not allowed to bring your sacrifices inside the temple because you're not one of us. You're not Jewish, therefore you cannot come in here. You're a foreigner, stay away. And it's so ironic that Jesus uses this as the way that he operates because the nine, what did they do? We don't know for sure, but likely they went back to the priest They got healed, they were healed, they were reinstated in society, went on with their merry life, were able to enter the temple building with their sacrifices to a cold and dead religion because Jesus has come and that old way is no longer valid. But this one, the least likely, he entered into the presence of Christ, did he not? He went back and found him and he fell at the feet of Christ because he knew he didn't need to go to the temple any longer. So we all have access to him anytime, always. And this one leper knew that, and I hope you do too. So here we find ourselves in the last verse, verse 19. And here's what Jesus said as that leper falls at his feet. And he said to him, the Samaritan, the only one who returned, He said, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. Now, again, this is where we have to have the context of the entire gospel of Luke because we know the whole gospel is about salvation. And you would read this and say, okay, well, he just made him well. That means his skin's healed and he can go on with life. Well, no. If you look at the Greek, and that's why I'm a little, not disappointed, well, okay, I'm a little disappointed in whoever translated a lot of our uh, Bibles because the Greek word is sozo, Z-O, or S-O-Z-O. It's sozo. It's where we get our word for salvation. So if we read this like we do the other accounts, the same word in all the other salvations in the New Testament. Your faith has sozoed you. Your faith has saved you. That's what Luke is writing as what Christ said himself. Get up, go, your faith has saved you. This is the second miracle. The first miracle was the healing of the body, and then the second miracle was the salvation that happened. So what can we take away from this? The nine lepers, they received physical healing. They got to go on with their merry life and put and go all in in this world. But the one who returned His faith is what saved him. And I love this. You know, it wasn't two of the 10. It wasn't three of the 10. It was one of the 10 that returned. And it's 
Matthew, or Jesus talked about this in the Gospel of Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. He said, enter through the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and there are many who enter through it. 90% of the people that Christ healed that day went on with their lives and didn't come back to receive salvation. Is that true in our society? What about, would you say about 10% of us truly know him? I don't know, but it's not very many. But Jesus went on to say, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and few find it. That is what this story of the lepers is about. The one man, the few that found salvation in Christ. So as we leave this building, as we go out with a heart of thanksgiving for the salvation that we found in Christ, let us remember this story and to truly be thankful for. And I have two questions for you. One, which one are you in this story? Are you the one who returned? Or are you one of the nine that chose to go your own way? And then secondly, maybe you know Christ. Maybe you are the one who returned to give glory to him. We know this, that God's never not working. God's like that head and shoulder shampoo, never not working. He is always doing something. So if you know him today, what's he doing in your life? And are you following where he's leading? Are you going like he commanded these leopards to go? So we're going to give you a chance here in just a minute to respond to what God's doing in your life, but that's my question. Are you being faithful with where God has you today, Thanksgiving week 2022, here in Kansas? And that's a challenge for all of us. Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful for what you're doing here in Olathe and here at Fellowship Olathe specifically, but God, we, are, we know that we... As your word tells us, we're, we're the few. We're, we are entering through the narrow gate, but the broad way of our society and the broad way of many of our families and the broad way of many of our friends are going a totally different path. So God, we pray as we have a unique opportunity this week to be around family. Some of us don't have to go to work or school, so we have added time. God, I pray that we would be intentional with it. And, and not only that, but we would be intentional individually as we seek your will for our lives, as we seek what you're doing with our lives individually. Maybe there's a sin that we need to surrender to you once and for all. Maybe there's a decision that we need to fast about and come into your presence and truly pray over that we're dealing with this week. Maybe it's a job situation or a health issue. God, allow us to be a people that are intentional, that just as the leper who returned, that we would fall on our face and bring our worries to you. You tell us in your word that come to me all who are weary and heavy heavy laden and I will give you rest. Lord, that's what we're asking today. Give us rest in you and you alone. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen.